Good afternoon, everyone. Daniel Cruz here from CISA's National Risk Management Center, and welcome to another exciting panel as part of the CISA Cybersecurity Summit, leading the digital transformation theme. When we talk about digital transformation, I think a key pillar of that is the increasing interconnectedness of the systems and networks that collectively underpin the critical infrastructure community whose resilience we all care about. And, and another reality of this interconnectedness is that it puts an increased emphasis on the importance of supply chain risk management. Increasingly, software plays a critical part in those supply chain risk management conversations. So this session here today will focus on how we secure that software supply chain. And we've got a great panel of experts here to help us better understand this important issue. So starting out, we have Kate Stewart, who is a Senior Director of Strategic Programs at the Linux Foundation. Kate, thanks for joining us. Thank we you. Also have doc Welcome. We also have Dr. Alan Friedman from NTIA at the Department of Commerce, and he leads a lot of the cybersecurity initiatives there. Alan, thanks for coming. And last, last but not least, we have Dr. Trey Herr, who is the Director of the Cyber Statecraft Initiative at the Atlantic Council and has done a lot of academic and think tank type work recently in this space. So we got a great panel here and want to get to the discussion as I, I think there's a, a lot we can better understand about the importance of securing the software supply chain. So Trey, I want to start with you here and, and, and based on the recent report you helped author, Breaking Trust, want to get a better sense kind of at the high level why all this matters and that report has some really helpful examples of known exploits in the software supply chain which i think really set the stage of why having trust assurance in our software supply chain is so important so if you wouldn't mind give us the high level why is this so important yeah so it's a it's a fun topic because software is everywhere right the joke is that software has has eaten or is eating the world and when we think about supply chains for technology, it's difficult to extricate them from software. So the dependence on running code, understanding its provenance, where it came from, how we trust it, forms a lot of the basis for risk in cybersecurity and forms the foundation for a lot of our ability to uh, both assess and manage against that sort of risk in cybersecurity. So we, as you, as you referenced, which is helpful, we just published this report, Breaking Trust, um, this was a year-long effort to look at 115 different attacks and disclosures across the software supply chain running between 2010 and 2020. Um, and the reason that we did this, and I think the reason that we're having this conversation today is, is sort of twofold. First, the aggregate private exposure to software supply chain attacks is increasing. We're seeing ever more intelligent and capable code placed into operational technology and seeing industries from nonprofits and academic sector as well all the way up to the most sophisticated Fortune 500 companies, depending on this incredibly feature-rich software. Feature-rich software that is developed by a tremendously complex diversity of actors that embeds and is related to lots of other different forms of software, whether they open source or proprietary. So that attack surface for software supply chain attacks has been growing. The second is thinking about the way that the government uses software. There's a tremendous dependence on commercial off-the-shelf technology for the defense community. So thinking about the growth of GPS, scaled data analytics, the ability to pull images and analyze them uh, autonomously from drones, you know, thousands of miles away from the continental United States. Most of these technologies depend on commercial off-the-shelf tech. And those technologies are rooted in software, right? The image analytics, the complex math, the statistical analysis um, is embedded in code. And so while all of that ability to pull from commercial technology from open source and off the shelf technology has allowed for this sort of tremendous and rapid increase in defense capability it's also brought with it some of these dependencies on these code bases and so we have this sort of second access of exposure where the defense community as it's buying and integrating commercial technology has to bring with it that long tail of code and be considerate of where that supply chain has has risk or is assuming risk for them um, so the study has two interesting trends I want to call out for this discussion. I think they're particularly important as we're thinking about why the software supply chain matters and where we see that risk translating up the chain to organizations today. Uh, the first is 27% of the attacks and disclosures that we surveyed directly targeted software updates. What this means is that attackers were able to either sign malicious code, have it appear authentic, 
or were able to actually include their malicious code inside of an authentic program without the knowledge of the developer, so it was distributed to a user. The problem with this is that that relationship of a software update to the user is a really critical channel of trust. If I'm running uh, a modern browser and I get the little notification that I should be updating that browser, I click on it, I pull down a new version, and I'm running more secure uh, code. That's a boon for my security, and it's a boon for the security of the broader technology ecosystem. But it depends on my willingness to click to pull that update down, to actually run that new piece of code. If I start to believe that this browser manufacturer has been targeted and successfully compromised and is actually seeding malicious versions of these packages, malicious versions of these applications, I'm less likely to pull down that update. And it denudes defenders of the ability to reach their users, to reach the community that needs updated code, that needs new features. And so the, the first really exciting trend is that we see so many of these attacks targeting updates. It's a concern for defenders, but it's a concern for the policy community because that ability to trust an update is a really critical linkage in the defense process. The second is we see attacks targeting widely popular open source projects and a number of them which support a healthy functioning of the internet, be that features to present text on uh, the web or actually to secure content, but just moving between server and client. So the challenge with uh, supply chain attacks targeting the open source community isn't something that's rooted in the way that the open source community works. It's not that open source is broken and it's not that there's a culture problem. It's that these are tremendously creative projects supported often out of the goodwill of individuals, time and effort and energy. And they were never really intended to be significantly important infrastructure underlying major software projects and the Internet. And so the challenge that we have thinking about this as a policy uh, framing is how do we support open source projects that are being targeted in this way to help drive improved security practices, to help change the approach to securing these code bases without harming the underlying culture and the underlying ecosystem that's brought these sort of creative products about. And this gets me to the last point, and like the last reason that we're here sort of talking about software supply chain security, which is uh, when we think about software, when we think about the ability to take code, trust it and use it, we're talking about a very simple process of taking advantage of computing, right? Without, you know, going back to, to Ada Lovelace, right, in the first program written for uh, the digital computing machine with Charles Babbage, the ability to take, to make use of a computing device is rooted in the ability to make it think, to take information, to take uh, programs and to run them together. So when we think about the significance of security in the software supply chain, we're really talking about the ability to take advantage of information and computing technology. And it's the reason that we named the report Breaking Trust. The systemic threat posed by attacks on the software supply chain are that we are undermining our trust in this technology ecosystem. We're undermining our own willingness to take advantage of these technologies, to take advantage of these capabilities. And as we're seeing, there are some really interesting trends in the way that, that attackers are breaking this trust and threatening our ability to take advantage of that technology. So it's a worthwhile topic for conversation. And I think as we're going to get into an area where there's a lot of room for progress, both in the private and the public sector. Thanks, Troy. That was really helpful. And I think you gave a good overview there of why this is so important and why we need to have trust in our software supply chain just with the ubiquity of software underpinning so much of the critical processes in our lives and across the critical infrastructure community. You mentioned open source as one of the key trends where you're seeing an increased amount of attacks against the open source community. I think this is a good pivot here to pull in some of Kate's expertise. Kate, would love to get your thoughts on that. What is the prevalence of open source across various applications and, and use cases we might be familiar with? And then do you see this as a, is this a concentrated source of risk, sort of piggybacking off what Trey mentioned? Or is the other side of the coin that this is actually an opportunity, if done right, for scalable risk management? Sure. Um, I'll basically think that, um, well, Trey said source um, source codes, you know, eating the world. Actually, I think it's open source is actually what's eating the world right now. Um, we're seeing a lot of um, projects and then products being made from open source. Um, last year's Black Duck report, uh, the 2020 Black Duck report, which is a software um, scanning company, 
Um, basically, 99% of the code bases they audited had some open source in them. And then of that, open source made up over 70% of those audited code bases. So open source is tremendously prevalent. And that's not the only um, source code analysis tool group that's been sort of quoting on this subject. Uh, last year, um, Sonotype put out their report and they've observed basically double and triple digit growth in open source components for the last decade and there's no slowdown in sight. Basically, we've got that type of curve going on here. And um, as a result, um, we've got to start changing how we're paying attention to it and understanding what's there because all of these components are being hidden in multiple layers, um, be it in things like containers where you basically, oh, I just installed this container and it'll run, that is good. Um, trying to understand what's in there is one of the bigger challenges that's out there right now. And what we need to do is look at figuring out, um, you know, how can we actually start to automate this whole infrastructure and get so it can scale. And so there's a variety of open source projects and programs that are looking at that type of problem right now too. But we need tooling and we need to have a way of communicating. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what do we do about all this, right? What are the tools to actually help us drive some of these security and resilience results that we're after? And, and Alan, you have been sitting patiently here, but you've been a a, a leader a, across the community and, and the federal government on pushing one particular tool that while might not be a silver bullet, certainly can play a, a, a large component in how we drive some of this trust. Building off what, what Trey and, and Kate mentioned to sort of talk about the risk landscape here and the threats, I want to tell us a little bit about the efforts you've been leading on SBOM and how you see them potentially as a targeted to solution to some of the issues that were just discussed. Sure, uh, thank you. And as, as Trey and Kate pointed out, uh, we need to do a lot. There's a lot of information we need, especially for folks that are, are in high assurance areas where it's very important to have a lot of information. But the starting point is to get transparency about what software we're using. We're going to want to build a lot more on that. But the necessary, if not sufficient step, is what is known as a software bill of material, or SBOM. And this is very simple. It's just a list of ingredients for the software we're using, right? You go to the store, you buy a Twinkie, it comes with a list of ingredients. Why don't we expect the same level of transparency from the most critical infrastructures we use? Now, I say that it is simple. Uh, begs the question, hey, why aren't we already doing this? And the answer is it's a little bit of a chicken and egg process where the folks uh, that are supplying it aren't being asked. No one's saying, hey, please tell me what this is. And no one's asking because no one's supplying. So what we've tried to do is bring together the entire software community to say what will work and what's feasible today, right? Rather than building a giant gold-plated solution that will take 10 years, we're trying to find solutions that can work today. And so an SBOM here is just the dependency graph uh, and We've created not a single standard, but a set of existing tool standards out there already. Um, we've identified a common vision that brings together everyone from, you know, medical device manufacturers to uh, modern app developers to the open source community. Kate's played a great leadership role in this uh, to folks across the U.S. government to say, what is the data that we need today and how do we make this work in scale? Scaling involves uh, saying it's got to be automatable, uh, it's got, and, and it has to be modular. It's got to be able to slot in to the other efforts we have in the rest of software assurance. We're not trying, again, to create a solution for everything. We're just looking for this transparency layer. And then the final piece is, like all good software projects, rather than building it first and seeing what happens, we're trying to test and iterate as we go. So this is not just agile tech development. This is agile policy development, uh, where we're working with, for example, uh, the healthcare community. Right? Uh, and, and what I love about this is this is such a priority that in the middle of the COVID crisis, this is still seen as a top priority for some of the largest hospitals in the United States and some of the same medical device manufacturers that are producing the machinery that we all need to be safe. Uh, and they've said, this is such a priority, we're going to keep moving forward to try an iterative proof of concept to show that this can work, figure out what the gaps are, and then keep iterating so that this can be ready. SBOM 
is it something that is off the shelf ready today? But we think it will be very soon. And right now we're looking for more folks to come in and say, yes, we want to try this. Thanks, Alan. You mentioned the analogy earlier to the nutrition or ingredient label on a Twinkie. And I, I think with that example, something we've seen is where there has been consumer awareness. Well, you know, there certainly has been pressure put on and some requirements put on the manufacturers of that food stuff to to have those ingredient labels. But we have also seen the uh, level of consumer awareness of that is something they now seek out and it helps inform their consumption habits. What's driving what in this case? Or is, is it one of the situations where once it le reaches a level of maturity, it becomes this virtuous cycle where both sides of the coin in inform one another? What, what, are, what dynamic are you seeing there? Uh, we're seeing a lot more interest in SBOM than we saw even a year or two ago. Uh, it, it's kind of interesting, right? If you basically offer this to folks, the first time they hear about that, they say, that's lovely, we want it. Uh, some of the suppliers are slowly getting used to the idea that this is going to be a little more transparency than they provided in the past. They have some natural questions, right? Won't this be used to attack me? Well, the answer is no. Any bad guys that want to know what you know top level includes you have in your product, they can find that out if they're sophisticated. And if they can't, uh, if they're unsophisticated actors, they don't care. They're just going to spray and pray some automatic code. What we want to do is put that data in the hands of the defenders so they can figure out what's at risk. So first is getting folks used to the idea of transparency. Second, I want to acknowledge there is going to be a one-time cost of updating your process, but this is something that gets to the rest of software assurance, right? We all need to have better development processes. Uh, Kate's work in the Linux Foundation is tied to uh, helping projects mature and be able to demonstrate other areas of a secure development lifecycle. SBOM is one part of that. What I love about SBOM is because it is so visible down the supply chain, we think that market solutions will be very powerful to drive it back up the supply chain. As more folks demand it at as large enterprise customers demand it, uh, we think it will actually drive change in the industry. I also do want to acknowledge uh, that this is something that other parts of the government, uh, both in the United States and around the world, are interested in. Uh, the FDA, which regulates medical devices, has already said they're going to be requiring this for any new device that's sold needs to come with an SBOM. We've heard interest from other parts of the government in requiring this as well. What we think at NTIA is we should make sure this is something we can do before we start requiring it. So we need to make sure this scales and it is being a common practice. And then, you know, a government is going to do what a government's going to do. Yeah, and I guess part of the making it scale means that we have to actually have tools out there that work for companies as well as tools that work out there for open source. And so the open source solutions are not going to be paying necessarily for, you know, for um, software from specific companies. Therefore, we need to have open source solutions for the open source projects so that they can actually do their own monitoring and own reporting. Since open source is so prevalent throughout there, we need to make sure that we have that good foundation for all those products to be built on top of. And Alan and Katie both bring up, I think, a really key point, right, that the viewers want to take away, and you're hearing it as a theme. Approaches towards security best practices, towards enumeration, towards risk management need to be automated. They need to be easy to use. They need to be open source. Creating additional barriers to entry for any developer, open source or proprietary, to take what, what we're defining or what policymakers are defining as the best or the optimal security approach, making it hard for them to put it in their workflow, all of that undercuts these efforts. So I think you're, you're hearing some really good themes and, and others I think that have been captured in the report and elsewhere that whatever outputs from these policy processes come, they need to be easy to adopt and they need to be right in the workflow for developers rather than on a PDF. You know, death to PDF standards. <laughs> or spreadsheets. And, or spreadsheets, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think once this is a little more common, we're going to be able to start to see innovation and a maturity model that starts to address a lot of the threats that Trey, Trey's report has mm -hmm. talked about, uh, which is, you know, Hey, once I know what the software is in my network, I can do some graph math and say, all right, I've got 10,000 components, but with a little bit of engineering, I can figure out that these 500 are the ones that if compromised could actually compromise the system. Well, now I can just watch those really closely. Uh, or I can start to say, you know, since I know if it's open source, I can say, hmm, 
here's the developer key for each of these commits, and most of them are pretty common or ones that I've seen before. But this is the, something that computers and some basic machine learning are really good at. So I can start to say, hmm, that developer key was only ever used in some random Ruby project before. So there's a decent chance it was stolen. I'm going to do some further risk analysis. I'm going to investigate and spend my dollars there. Or this new update has, you know, 100 times the entropy of a similarly sized update. So there's a chance it might be obfuscated. There's a chance that someone is trying to put in something, a backdoor maybe, that they didn't want an ordinary developer to be able to detect. So I'm going to, again, spend some resources and do my risk analysis there. SBOM won't solve that, but it enables that. Yeah, and to complement that, the open source projects are trying to adopt more best practices and spread more awareness of the security mindset and so forth into these projects. And so we're sort of seeing um, the best practices that in the Corporate Structure Initiative the Linux Foundation, we've got about 3,000 open source projects that are key projects that have gone through the exercise of self-documenting and making everything available through queryable APIs so that people can basically look and see, okay, you know, do they know how to handle security? Do they Are they doing fuzzing? Are they doing static analysis? What are those communities doing? So, so you can figure out which projects you might feel more comfortable using as your basis. Um, and it's a step in the right direction, but obviously there's a whole bunch more projects out there that we've been talking about right now. We're talking about into the millions. So the landscape is there that we need to have tools and we need to have tooling available to look at things during the build and then after the build and then be able to bring things in and compare and contrast. These dimensions are all going to be needed to have an effective supply chain, and so that they may need to be able to use to the point that's been made already. <laughs> because these so pulling are, on, the, on that thread, Kate, that's a, yeah. it's, it's a good point. When we're talking generally about trust and assurance in the software supply chain and more transparency, understanding the ingredients that Alan is talking about, how do we sort of bucket and are there lines of demarcation in terms of development versus post deployment? And this has been a challenge that has come up in, in the CISA world a little bit through a lot of our 5G engagements where post deployment software assurance we have found, particularly when you're dealing with the high volume of code and have monthly firmware updates becomes particularly hard post deployment in terms of what you can have visibility over. H how are we thinking about different types of software assurance in terms of where it is in the development life cycle versus deployment and, and live and running systems at that point? So let me jump on this for a second because this is a really fun question for a couple of reasons. The first is part of the challenge we have is thinking about development and deployment as different stages. Right, as opposed to a continual iterative process where code is adapted to the user's needs in a process which is robust and secure and transparent. Um, and, it, and it breaks a lot of mental models about who does what and where is code and can we sort of, and, and I think that is part of this discussion. Part of the reason that this is so exciting is when we talk about supply chain security right now, it's still really rooted in hardware based assumptions. Somebody builds a widget, the widget gets integrated with some other widgets and it gets shipped to a user and that these stages are the milestones where we have to establish and assert trust. And the way that we assert trust has to be rooted back in what that original widget manufacturer did. And that's not always true with software, right? Trust can be transitive in a single line like this. It can also be peer to peer, right? It can be reestablished and broken and reestablished again at different points. And so one of the, th I'd say, so two things, I think in answer to your question, and I would love to throw the others. One is it's a continual process. And as especially the OT community and folks who are deploying large telecommunications networks as a great example, start to adapt to the fact that this development deployment cycle is a continuous thing and that they are part of it. As users, they are defining the need space, they are defining the security model that's acceptable and tolerable for how they're gonna operate. That, that partnership has to be an ongoing effort. It will change, I think, some of the approach to the limitations you're talking about, right? This volume of code, firmware or otherwise. The second piece is where security sits in that model can also change. And 5G is a great example. 5G is not just about hardware. If in fact, I think you could make a compelling argument. It's really, it, the minority issue is hardware. It's mostly about software. The move towards open architectures, the move towards virtualization, taking these specific hardware functions and putting them in software is a move towards more software attack surface, is a, is a move towards more code. 
that's interesting from the supply chain risk management standpoint because now you've got vendors who never had a software problem before dealing with software security, dealing with a software life cycle. So what I think we would, would come back and say is, A, it's a continuous process and everybody's involved. And part of the reason for this transparency and enumeration is to make sure everybody can see into what's going on and has access to in a poll fashion information rather than having to knock on someone's door to get what they need. But the second is this software is everywhere. And so for the 5G vendor who's worried about how often they've got to update their firmware, they've got to realize they're as much a part of the software development process as anybody else. Yeah, great points. And I think everyone here has really hammered home just the ubiquity of what we're trying to solve for here and the volume and, and what that necessitates in terms of the tools, the changes of approach and, and the need for transparency. We've, we've got a few minutes left here, and so I want to just do a lightning round and get everyone's perspective. I think we've got a good understanding now of why this is important in terms of data integrity and resilience of connected infrastructure. I think we've got a good understanding of the ubiquity of some of the efforts underway to provide that transparency, whether it's through SBOM tools or otherwise. Trey, you just talked about partnership. I think that's a good way to close it out. Would love all your perspectives on where you see the most promising partnership activities taking place right now that for everyone watching who who understands why this is important, where, where, where people can lean in across the community to help be part of this solution going forward. So start with you, Alan. Uh, so I'm really excited about the number of folks that are interested in doing sort of a proof of concept exercise around SBOM. Right. They're not waiting for governments to tell them what they need to do. They're saying we need to work on this for our own interests, but we also need to make sure this meets our needs. Uh, and so we've got folks in energy, in automotive, uh, in telecom, 5G, as Trey mentioned, is very important. Uh, healthcare, of course, uh, a lot of folks are really excited to say, let's try this out. Let's make sure it works for our needs. Let's do it safely in a protected fashion, and then we can scale from there. Great. And how about you, Kate? Uh, what I'm thinking, what I'm seeing is really interesting is the fact that we've got multiple formats that are working right now between SPDX with Cyclone DX. So we've got formats and we've got tools starting to emerge. And so getting more people engaged in those open source projects and are supporting those tools and they're doing what they need and giving use cases, um, submitting code, submitting issues, and they're having problems solving things with them. Um, getting more of that input from those proof of concepts and so forth, and then using them to improve the tools will make it better for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. And Trey, curious on your perspective, I know Breaking Trust had a number of recommendations on this front. I'll, I'll cheat a little bit because I think Kate and the Linux Foundation have been doing some tremendous work. The open source, um, you know, I think it's the Open Source Security Foundation that is newly formed is a great effort that combines a lot of different private vendors and open source experts in the space. It's got some funding behind it. Would love to see more public money go there. Uh, so I think that is a, a really exciting avenue for public-private collaboration. The other, though, I'll say is, and I think SBOM is an interesting example of this, the push for transparency opens up the market for folks to identify and build solutions, right? whether they're open source or proprietary, and making supply chain an accessible market, an accessible security problem for new ideas and for good ideas is really crucial. And so I would say that, that any effort towards making supply chain accessible, making it a norm for transparency and getting away from this idea that this needs to be a secret lockdown protected proprietary space is a positive thing for the public sector security as well as for the public at large. Absolutely, all great points. Appreciate the leadership of all three of you, what you're doing in your respective arenas in this space. I think plenty of work that remains to be done here. So we'll let everyone get back to solving these problems and adding transparency to the supply chain. But thank you for joining us for this portion of the CISA Cybersecurity Summit. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Take care.